Welcome to the new school. What we wanted to do was talk about the concept of authenticity and vulnerability in an industry that has typically been super buttoned up, super professional, and a little bit old school. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number eight of the New School Video Podcast. If you've been listening for a while and you're loving it, we would so appreciate it if you would give us a review. If you're new, welcome. My name is Candace Carlton, and I'm the head of advisor education at FICOM Partners. In this episode of the New School Video Podcast, I'm joined by our CEO, Meg Carpenter, as we talk to Danny Fava. So in case you didn't know, and you probably know, Danny Fava is synonymous with innovation. In her previous role, she was the head of institutional innovation at TD Ameritrade before they were acquired by Schwab, and is now the head of strategic development at InvestNet, leading transformation. She is committed to what she calls future-proofing the RAA industry and is known for showing up at industry events to speak in her Nike high tops and saying the things that we're all often thinking but not actually articulating. In this episode, she takes us through her journey to show up more authentically at work, what that means and how that impacts innovation. And she also shares some of the ways she used to pretend at work. It's fascinating. We think you're going to love it. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Danny, thank you so much for coming on the new school. We are psyched, psyched to have you. And I know you're in the middle of thinking about moving, wanting to move. So in the middle of a pandemic, tumultuous time, thanks for being here. It's, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be talking to you rather than uh, looking at houses and contracts and inspection reports right now. So it's a welcome distraction. Thank you. Daddy, this is the first time I'm meeting you other than our prep call, but I have been following you in the industry for a while. And I think when you were suggested as a guest, we unequivocally were like, for sure, yes. And Meg was like that. We were like, oh my God, yes. Because I think your reputation has become synonymous with innovation, quite frankly, for two reasons. <laughs> like you are director of innovation at TD Ameritrade. So that's a very real thing. You've now moved across to InvestNet and you're head of strategic development. But I think in every way, in shape and form, and even in our prep interview, you had talked about how you really just don't fit the mold and you see that as a huge advantage. Exactly. I, I couldn't have said it better, Candace. I have been, uh, it took me a long time to realize that my special skill, my superpower is not fitting in. That's, a, you know, I, it, it was a struggle not to fit in for a really long time, um, both in life as well as in my career. Um, and then, you know, through just listening and seeing other people be successful and, and reading and learning. I actually read the book Rebel Talents. And I think that might have been like a tipping point for me where I said, why am I faking who I am? It is my superpower that I don't think like everyone else and I'm not like everyone else. Um, and, and now I'm celebrating that I'm not like everyone else. And I think that is the very thing that has kind of made me successful over the last, you know, specifically over the last six or seven years. So specifically, just to like call it out, you're known for going to conferences and speaking on stage in sneakers. You've got a biggie t-shirt on right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so expressed in your fashion, but also in you are a Latina and you're a member of the LBGTQ environment. Uh, how do you feel like all these elements have helped and contributed to the way you think about the future of the industry? I love in your profile how you said you're responsible for future-proofing the industry. Um, how have those different perspectives, your background, do you think really helped you see how to solve problems differently? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I do think there is some innate ability to sort of view view the world from a different lens. Right. And I've always sort of um, stayed stayed quiet for very many years of my life, whether that be, you know, pr- pretending to be straight, pretending to be white, um, <laughs> pretending to be married at some points in my life. Right. Just to fit in in a room um, full of people. And so. I, I think for a long time, I, I kind of hid that innate ability to see things differently. And I would sit in a meeting and listen to what everyone is saying and have a completely different idea about the way things should go or could go or will go in the future. And, you know, staying quiet about that. And I think a lot of people have that innate ability to see things differently, but they don't speak up because they wouldn't fit in if they spoke up. Right. And so when you're sitting in a room of, you know, 10 people who are all straight, all white, all have wedding rings on, you very much want to want them to look at you and say, oh, you know, she's one of us. So you don't say the crazy thing, you know? So we, I think a lot of us have this crazy idea, which is probably a great idea and can be an even better idea if you say it out loud and let other people contribute to it. But we don't, we hold that back. And and, you know, for that for that eternal sort of um, that feeling of, of just wanting to be accepted. And so I think the, the more so the skill or what people need to learn is not so much how to look out into the future and how to think differently, but getting the confidence and feeling the power to be able to just say what's on your mind ask the hard question. You know, you're sitting there and you're saying, this doesn't make sense. I wonder if anyone else is thinking that this doesn't make sense. Isn't there a clear answer? I might say it, but that's probably wrong because no one else is saying it and you hold it in. And so I think if if I had to um, really explain what is so different about me is that I no longer, you know, think twice about saying the crazy thing. if If I disagree, well, the other nine people in the room agree, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say it sometimes gently, but I'm always going to say it, ask the hard question, give the crazy idea. Um, that, that is, I think at the, at the base of what makes me able to future proof the industry. I want to talk more about the struggle because the struggle is so real. So real. <laughs> what I was thinking when I was listening to you talk and sort of just, you know, envisioning my own experiences, you know, I, I, I asked myself the question sort of, was that entirely me? Like, was I the main obstacle? Was it my self-confidence? Was it my lack of alignment? Was it, you know, me just like not really truly knowing myself, which I think every day you learn more about yourself. Like, was it entirely me was it entirely the industry? And of course, it was a combination of all of the above. But like, in your experience, how much of your, you know, showing up in a room and feeling like, I'm the only one that doesn't have a wedding ring on, like, how much of that do you think was self imposed versus what other people were imposing on you? That is such a great question. And and I think, Megan, it is like 90% self imposed actually. And I think that percent grows as time goes on. Um, And you know what, though, there are, there are, it's, it just feels better. Like it just, it's a better feeling when you can um, relate to somebody, right? So I, we're still dealing with it in our industry and our industry is predominantly white, predominantly male. And these white males, they, they kind of, they congregate and they connect over different things, right? So I, you know, happen to play fantasy football um, and I find that I can connect with the other white straight men that I work with about fantasy football you know, a lot of women don't play fantasy football. A lot of um, Latino or black and brown people don't play, you know, golf and can't connect over these things that um, it seems that predominantly white men can connect over. And so that feeling of searching for something to connect with somebody on on a, on a sort of a personal level um, becomes really hard. And so although I think it is 
90% self-imposed, I really do think there's a lot of truth to, um, you know, not being able to connect on a personal level with somebody who doesn't look anything like you. You have to stretch. You really have to stretch and try to find there's something there. There's some kind of connection or commonality there, but it's not those surface level easy ones that, you know, are or seem so easy for people who come from the same background, who had the same upbringing, who lived in the same type of neighborhood and did the same things. You really have to stretch sometimes to find that commonality. What is it that you and I have in common that we can connect over? Because it can't just be all about work. You're going to need to connect on that personal level with someone. And so um, it's 90% self-imposed, but it's also 90% self-corrected, right? You have to just put in that effort to find the thing, stretch and find the thing. That person is going to be open to it. They 90%, they're they're open to connecting with you and they want to. You just have to go out of your way to find find the common ground um, and make those connections. I mean, everybody likes Biggie, it turns out. So that's usually, <laughs> that's usually the place that I can connect with people on. I love 90s hip hop and it turns out that um, most people do as well. <laughs> It's so funny. I was actually going to ask you a question about fashion because I think fashion is, I think people like my internal fear, because I'm very into clothes is that people will think I'm superficial because I like clothes, you know? And when actually you think about it, our clothes reflect a lot where we live, what we believe, what's going on in the world from a, like a socioeconomic perspective. If you think about fashion through the history and it's like an outward reflection of us signaling to each other things that we believe and like our worldview. So when you like, you've worked at big companies is the truth, like where there's kind of like, except TD Ameritrade was very innovative and very cool. Like I was always a big fan of TDs, you know, but it was still, you know, the sales team always looks like super sharp, you know, they did in their suits and whatever. And so as you navigate these big companies where there is kind of like a uniform, so to speak, like, and you just wore what felt appropriate to you. Was that like, was that just because like you couldn't bear to wear anything else? Was it because you made that conscious decision, your outfits were going to reflect what you believed? And did you have any blowback from that? Because you're basically saying from the outside before anyone interacts with you, like I'm my own person here. Wow. Yeah. Great question. And I agree with you. It means so much when I, um, when I step onto a stage to present in my Jordans, um, there's, and there's always this like back thought of how will, how will I be perceived? Um, but fortunately for myself, I've sort of built a brand that now that is to be expected. And so um, I, and hopefully I'm making, um, you know, a path for others to, to kind of follow, but I grew into this, Candace. Like I, I can remember crying in in the bathroom of a conference because um, somebody told me to hide my backpack because it shouldn't be at the booth. So I was like, you know, working working a booth for a large financial services company, and I had my backpack on a chair inside of the booth, and and I was, you know, scolded that you know who who what woman carries a backpack? Put that under the table so people can't see that. No one will take you seriously. Mm. And you know, I I cried because it, you know it's not me. I don't I don't carry a bag. I don't carry. I would never you know buy a Louis Vuitton or have a have a you know a, a showy bag to um, wouldn't just wouldn't make me comfortable. And so, can you imagine? Um, feeling so, so out of place that you need to cover everything you do and everything about you, there will be no energy or brain space left to be smart, innovative, and, you know, um, successful. So really what would happen for me was I said this, I know that I can make a difference in this industry. And I know that my um, innovative potential is so strong that if I don't 
let go of all this energy that I'm spending covering and pretending, I'm never going to reach my full potential. And I heard, and it, I'm so bad with names, so excuse me for not remembering um, this gentleman's name, but I listened to an Olympic swimmer talk and a gay Olympic swimmer about him winning a gold medal in Canada. And it was the first Canadian gold medal for an individual swimmer. And the story that he tells about what drove him over the line to win. And in, and actually at an older age, after he kept missing, he kept getting third place. He kept, it was, the story was that he came out. He came out as a gay man. And he said, the next time I hit the water in, a, in an Olympic event, I was literally lighter. And I was able to propel myself over the finish line because I don't have that weight anymore on me of being somebody or trying to pretend to be somebody that I'm not. So I, I think Candace, I've grown into this and I just had to say to myself, I don't care because I am going to shed this weight and I am going to put all of my energy and effort and brain space and thought into my work. And my work is going to speak for itself. And if anyone rejects my biggie shirt or my sneakers or my brown skin or my <laughs> sexual orientation, you know, they, they're missing out because this is me at my best self. And you're going to get my best ideas and my hardest work and my clearest thoughts that are unburdened by this weight if you just let me be myself. And so that, you know, back to back to Megan's question before – it is 90% self, self-imposed and 90% self-corrected. You just have to make the decision to, to do you. And everyone can do that. I think that there's sometimes this perception, misperception that you have to be a famous author, an Olympian, someone who is winning awards in financial services, which you are, right? Like that you have to sort of have this profile to be able to like find that truth, find that alignment, have that confidence. And I think there's many, many people that are marginalized that might sit in their homes or in their office and think, well, you know, they can find this alignment because look at them, they've achieved something that in my mind, like I think I haven't achieved. And so I still have to sit here and I still have to sit in this corner and I still have to pretend, you know? And I, what I'm loving about listening to you speak, Danny, is like this can, this sense of being and alignment and truth can absolutely be achieved by anyone at any stage in their life for any purpose that they're looking for. Like you don't have to be a gold medal Olympian swimmer. You don't need to be Glennon Doyle who writes untamed. Like you don't need to be Brene Brown. Like you can do these things. I, I couldn't agree more. And the more people that do them, the more space we're creating for more people to do them. Right. So it's this virtuous cycle of acceptance and just keep, just keep pushing the envelope forward. You can do one small thing that brings your true self to work and see how good that feels. And that kind of feeling begets more desire to be more of yourself. So um, I, I do agree, Megan, it can be anyone. It's there, There's been a movement that has started. We can all sort of feel it, right? Or you guys through this podcast are celebrating this movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, I think it, it, more people will will be able to be their true selves um, if we keep pushing that forward. I think so. And I think we also need to talk about like the 10% that's not self-imposed, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, sure. how, can, how can we help? How can we help people understand like what that 10% feels like? And I agree with you because I've that's been my journey. It's been mostly a mental battle in my own mind that I need to show up a certain way and that I need to say a certain thing. And if I don't, I won't be respected. I won't be accepted. Um, people will think that I'm not very good at what I do, you know, so like, but I agree with you that it's mostly in here, but there's also an industry and I can only speak to this industry because I've grown up in this industry, but like, doesn't always support you. Like it, there's um, subconsciously inherently sort of this sense of just marginalizing people that are not, that don't look like you. And, and, and I think that that's an area where 
everyone needs to do like little things to be able to make that 10%, you know, 9% and then 8% and like think about the exponential growth. And for me, it's been about support and real support. And what I've experienced is people in my career who would say, well, you know, I supported her. Look at me. I supported her. And I'm sitting here thinking like, did you really, you know, <laughs> did you really support me? Like, did you really try to actually help me and want nothing in return? And like Mark Tiburgeon is just the best example that I can share because from the moment I met him, he just wanted to support me. And I spent a lot of years asking like, why did I deserve this until I realized that I I'm worth it, but he never asked for anything in return. He introduced me to people. He tried to help me close business. He was constantly asking me, how am I, how can I help? And he was at the time, the CEO of Pershing Advisor Solutions, like as a young female professional, like what could I do for him? But like, it's that type of support. It's not just employing someone. It's not just saying, I give you a job and I, I give you a paycheck supporting you. Like that's not support, that's employment. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about people who either have supported you or moments where you just haven't felt that support? Yeah. For? And what I would love to get to is like, how can the industry hear that from us and maybe think about how are they supporting people? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the road that you've given me to talk about the 10%. And you can see me now like sitting up in my chair and hovering over the microphone because I'm like, oh, that 10%, the 10% who really don't want you to be yourself. The 10% who thankfully are, you know, um, be, are the minority now, the people who don't, you know, who want to keep the industry looking the same and want to edge out the people who are different. Um, those people exist. Let's be very, let me be very candid and frank. Those people exist and they're out there and they're both doing it purposefully um, and, and sometimes unconsciously. Uh, I have had several experiences in this industry, which have been, um, I, I've spoken about them. I, I've written about them anonymously sometimes. Um, for example, I was at a very big senior level conference and it was my first time invited to the senior leadership conference. And I was very excited to be there. Of course, very nervous, had my backpack, <laughs> um, <laughs> Woke up for breakfast in the morning and I'm walking around looking for a seat at one of the tables where there's all of these people who all look the same and they all have these things in common. And I'm nervous um, because that never goes away. If you walk into a room and no one looks like you, it's it's pretty high anxiety. But, you know, you force your way through it walking around and um, a gentleman got up from his chair, turned around and handed me his dirty plate. (gasps) <gasps> and as I stood there looking at him and he looked at me and it hit him probably at the same time that it hit me what he had just done. Mm-hmm. He had assumed that I was cleaning the table and that he should. And he thought he was doing me, a you know, a solid by handing me his plate so that I didn't have to go pick it up myself. Right. So. Um, and this is one this is one story uh, about when you run into that 10 percent. And here's the thing, that 10% can make you feel incredibly small. And I carried that weight around with me for the rest of the conference. And the entire time that I was there, I didn't feel like I belonged there. And I felt tiny and small. And in that 30-second interaction, that one man, that one action, and he was extremely apologetic over it, it ruined my entire conference experience. And it took me a little while to build myself up because of it. So let's not downplay, which um, I might have done before that 10%, because they're only 10% of people and you only have to interact with them for a fraction of the time. But my goodness, the kind of impact that that will leave on you and have on you should not be, should not be downplayed. It's very difficult to recover um, from those moments. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, you're going to have those moments 10% of the time. Think about that. One out of every 10 days you go to work being in the, being in the skin and in the clothes that you're in, you're going to have one of those interactions. Um, It's a lot. So I don't think I have like the magic recipe to, to kind of, um, 
tell you how to solve it or how to get over it or how to move past it. But I can tell you this, the more light we shine on it, the more that people will understand they're not the only ones dealing with it. And maybe the more people will sort of wake up and realize, hey, I got to fix myself. That 10% is either going to age out of the industry or they're going to be embarrassed out of the industry or, you know, something. So our job, I think, is to shine light on it and make sure that we're all talking about it and that you know, I, I'm not saying name and shame because some of these things are, you know, unconscious biases. And the man who who I had that interaction with is actually a very nice person that I, I respect. And I don't think that he's, you know, anything else besides somebody who grew up in America. <laughs> so, um, you know, shine a light on it, talk about it. And let's, you know, let's be the vocal majority. I think that's how we we solve it. There's so much change happening. I think uh, it's not just change in our industry. It's change in America. It's change in the world. Like, you know, I think like it's interesting from a marketing and communications perspective, we concepted and launched the new school and the new school mindset and ethos in response to the change. It's not just like some cool idea we came up with like in a silo and we're like, we're just going to push, you know, we're going to do this cool thing. It's in direct response to like how we're seeing the world change, what people's expectations are. And I think now more than ever, there's this yearning to be more human. And from a marketing perspective, what that means for advisors specifically is showing up more authentically, showing up as themselves because clients want to work with a person, with a human, not like someone who's in a suit, like who is a robot because you can do a robo advisor, I guess. I don't know if they're in a suit. But as you think about how all of this is changing, how you're navigating these different worlds and it's all integrating into your experience. How have you seen that play out specifically in your role, what you're working on and where you see things moving? Yeah, so now th this is more of a question of like, how do I innovate, right? Like, how do I, how do I stay on the, on the bleeding edge of what's going on? And, and what is it about this whole thing that, that's kind of um, makes me, makes me successful uh, in the role that I'm in? So I, I think because you are different, you should do something that no one else is doing, right? To truly embrace it. Um, and one of the things that I do is I keep a very um, close eye and a very tight hold on what's happening in the world. So, you know, the changes that we're seeing socially around the desire to be an individual creator, a la TikTok, the um, desire to change the world from a diversity lens, the desire to clean up the world from a, you know, climate perspective, those things are going to eventually impact financial services in a very, if they, you know, if they're not already in a very profound way. And I think what, what I'm sort of doing differently is um, spending the time to think about how I, how I want it to change financial services. Right. So we have these social and economic changes that are happening broadly in the world and the country that are playing out before us on social media and everywhere. And are, are, who is really tying together what does what changes should happen in financial services to support and advance those issues, right? So a lot of people are thinking about defensively, Oh, how are we going to, oh my gosh, every, all of these clients are going to want this thing. How are we going to, you know, what are the table stakes for us to have this thing out there where I think what I'm doing differently is saying, wow, look at, look at the change that's happening in the world. I want to be a part of that change. I want the solutions that I'm building or envisioning to help progress that change and really hit the hearts of people who are, who are changing with it. Um, and that's sort of, the way that I, I'm looking at it differently and, and trying to also help educate people around what those changes are and what they really mean. 
because it's not everybody who can really keep a close finger on the pulse of we, what's what's happening on in the world of you know in the world of Twitter and what are people like what are people saying what's the sentiment not everybody's got the capacity or the desire to do that so another part of what I try to do is educate um, and really talk about what are the trends how are they impacting um, the way people think and behave um, and what should you for example, the advisor community, what should you as a financial advisor be doing to stay relevant in this you know world of accelerating change? Um, so those are just some of the some of the ways that I think I'm you know contributing or or being successful in the in the world of innovation. I feel like we could chat forever about so many things we might need to do like a part two. I know Candace has some rapid fire questions, but um, I don't think I have a, I want to just say something. The first mm -hmm. time I heard you, I met you was at Bob Ferris's insiders forum in Nashville. That was probably five or six years ago at this point. Like it was, it was quite a while ago. And I remember you coming onto the stage and giving your presentation and it was the first time that I had heard the, I think you were the first presentation in the industry that really like used Uber and what was going on with Airbnb, like to talk about the opportunities it had, which by the way, then like everyone in the industry stole from you and used like, <laughs> and are still using it. Um, but I remember just sitting there and being like, why, why don't I know Danny? Like with, I, this is amazing. Like I, she's here. Like somebody like her is here. Thank God, you know? And so I feel like what I want to say to people that are listening is to your point about education. Like if you're sitting at, you know, and thinking about your role and whatever, you know, you're doing in financial services, if you're in an advisory firm or you're a service provider and you're thinking about how can I think ahead? How can I contribute to the change that I want to see? Like, Danny, you are a place that people should go to read, to listen, to be educated because of the way that you think. And I'm just so grateful that you're in this industry because we obviously so desperately need you. Yeah. They, thank you, Megan. And as a shameless self plug, I will say, I don't view anyone's at stealing my ideas. I want people to take whatever I'm saying and to um, amplify it. And so I, my, my ideas are open for everyone to continue to use. And if they put their own stamp on it, I think that's absolutely fine. And as a self plug, I am coming out with a mega trends deck, which is the first time I've actually created like a really comprehensive self service style deck. I don't love presenting on video. I can't wait to get back out there in person. So what I did was I put together all of my, you know, recent trends and what's happening in the financial services space. And I made it into a deck that can be consumed at your own leisure, at your own pace. And so that'll be coming out from InvestNet um, in the next few weeks if it's not already by the time this podcast comes out. Nice. I'm so cool, mega I, like that deck. <laughs> I, you. I will send you before everyone else gets it. <laughs> uh, okay. So we've got some rapid fire. I, I know. I feel like we could just talk and talk. I've got lots of questions in my head, but to wrap it all up lovely and neatly, we've got a few fun questions for you, Danny. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Netflix show that you're binging right now. Oh, the enemies. Um, it's about, oh wait, that's not on Netflix. It's on Showtime. Does that count? Okay, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about the history of, uh, the FBI and their relationship with the president, starting from, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Nixon. What is a podcast or YouTube series that you're just hooked on right now? Oh, man, it's embarrassing to say it because it's really, you shouldn't, all right. You don't listen to it if your kids are in the car, but, I'm really in love with a Brilliant Idiots, who's uh, Charlemagne the God. He is um, hilarious and talks about some real world issues and does a lot uh, through the through the election. He did a lot of politics from, you know, from his perspective, which was very unique and also relatable. But it is really um, not not for under 18. <laughs> what is the name of it again? I miss that. It's a uh, brilliant idiots. <laughs> brilliant idiots. Okay. Yeah. What's one thing people don't know about you that they'd be surprised to know? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with, <laughs> um, some people know this about me, but I, I did a stint in the roller derby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <cool. Yeah. laughs> Amazing. 
<laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I always say that I've lived a thousand lives. There have been a ton of things that I have tried and failed at, um, but roller and roller derby was one of them. <laughs> I love that. Um, Danny, what does the new school mean to you? Oh, it's it's a it's a celebration of um, who I personally have become and who I hope um, you all and we all together can light the way for more people to become. I love it. Where can people find you? I've seen you're quite active on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter is my favorite spot. I love Twitter. You get my I have two Twitter accounts. One is professional. One is personal. You're all welcome to follow both of them. Uh, you get a little bit more flavor from my personal Twitter, but I try to keep my innovative uh, thoughts about the industry on my professional one. And then where can people get that deck once you've... Oh, yeah. It'll be available on the InvestNet uh, public website. So we will be emailing it um, to all of our clients, but it'll also be available for public consumption on the InvestNet website. Danny, thanks for coming on. Uh, to everyone who's listening, if you love this episode, please share it with someone that you know would love it too. Thanks for coming on, Danny. Thank you, you so much.